Okay, got PowerPoint to record, not as a crutch. <laughs> okay, so let's first start off um, the lecture talking about this paper that I assigned. Engineered symbionts activate honeybee immunity and limit pathogens. This is Leonard et al. Science 2020. Should have looked like this. Hopefully you guys all read the paper. So really, really good paper. Um, Sean Leonard is a really good researcher, rising star in Texas. Um, and the Barrick Lab and Nancy Moran's lab are really, really good labs that have worked on molecular biology and insect symbionts. So this is just a really good paper with a lot of stars and um, the data and the project is just really good and really cool. So I hope everybody did this justice and I hope everybody read the paper because it's a really good paper. So we should all know about honeybees, okay? Honeybees are important in agriculture for multiple reasons. Um, not just because they are used to make honey, but because they are important pollinators. Okay, so honeybees pollinate crops. Many of the crops that we grow, many of the crops that we grow would not um, create fruits or nuts if they were not pollinated by the honeybees. Okra, kiwis, potatoes, onions, cashews, celery, strawberry, beets, mustard, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, papaya, chestnuts, watermelon, tangerine, coconuts, cucumbers. There are so many crops. There are so many crops that are pollinated by honeybees. Okay, the list goes on and on and on and on. So without honeybees, we would not have um, good farming of those crops, okay? Honeybees are actually rented by farmers. So a farmer will plant their field, okay? And then they will actually buy, they'll spend money and they will buy cages, okay, of honeybees to be released on their property, okay? So they will pay money for this. They will pay money for apiculturists who grow honeybees to bring boxes to their farm and release honeybees on their farm, okay? They pay this because this is, this is how they farm their crops. So honeybees are extremely important. And in the recent years, we have started researching and sort of observing this phenomena, which is called colony collapse disorder. Okay, colony collapse disorder, I, as an entomologist, I've heard a lot about it for many years. It's kind of, in my opinion, it's kind of a, a catch-all term that means kind of a lot of things. Um, and the mechanism for it could be a lot of different things and a lot of different things combined. In general, it sort of means, what it means is sort of unexplained disappearance of bee colonies, okay? So, in what you'll see in this is the hives, if you have like, if you have like a beehive, what you'll see is all the bees will just disappear, they'll fly away. And they'll leave the queen in the hive and then this hive will essentially die, okay? And there's lots of mechanisms for how colony collapse disorder might happen. Um, some of the mechanisms include mites. So the bee, the bee hives, the bee hives might get sick. The bee hives get sick. Some of the pathogens that they have include mites. The big mite species is Varroa destructor, okay? So these are like little, mites are things that have eight legs, okay? They're kind of like, I guess kind of like chelicerates. I think they're in the chelicerate family. 
like spiders, um, but they're tiny, 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 tiny mites, and they crawl, they crawl on the honeybee body, okay, and they make them sick. They make the honeybees sick, and um, honeybees can essentially their colonies can collapse because of these mites. And the mites also spread diseases. So the mites are also vectors of RNA viruses like deformed wing virus, okay? So sometimes these mites, inside of them, sometimes they have viruses and they infect the honeybee with these viruses. And so the, the honeybee even gets more sick, okay? And if your whole colony, if your whole hive is infested with mites and viruses, okay? That's a recipe for colony collapse disorder, okay? And so recently, many researchers have observed that colony collapse disorder seems to be happening more frequently. So it seems that more and more and more beehives just keep dying keep keep dying okay so this is a big problem okay this is a problem if if our beehives continue to die at a growing rate we're going to have a big problem for pollination in agriculture okay and this is this is people are trying to fix this problem people are trying to figure out how can we fix colony collapse disorder how can we promote or enhance bee health okay and so this is a central question that's addressed by this by this paper okay and just to give a little bit more context um you might imagine you might imagine um that you could perhaps give a transgene to bees that makes them stronger or healthier okay and this is a it's a it's a good idea this is a good idea but it's really really hard okay it's really hard to do transgenesis in bees it's really hard to give bees transgenes and one reason for that is because they're social okay so it's only it's most of the bees are not are not laying eggs it's just a queen that's laying eggs and it's hard to get access to those queens eggs and it's hard to sort of deliver the in theory what might be like a transposable element or it's hard to deliver in theory what might be an integrating plasmid to those embryos in the hive okay so the unique biology the unique biology of bees makes them difficult to how would I say to make transgenic okay so this is a good idea well maybe maybe we're gonna give the transgene to the bees that makes them stronger it's a good idea but it's not gonna work because it's hard okay so a different idea a different idea is a different strategy is called paratransgenesis. Okay. And this has been the topic. Um, this is essentially the topic for today. Paratransgenesis is when we take a symbiont. Okay. So this is a bacteria, a, a bacteria that lives inside a host. And bacteria are easy to make transgenic in most cases. You can just give bacteria plasmids and they'll take it up. We've talk, spent many, many, many hours talking about bacterial plasmids, okay? And how easy it is to transform bacteria with plasmids, okay? So one strategy for how we could give a transgene to a bee is through a paratransgenesis strategy. We could take a symbiont, a bacteria that lives inside of the host, and we can give the symbiont a plasmid to help the bee okay and in this case we're not transforming the bee we're transforming the symbiont and that is paratransgenesis it's transforming a symbiont with a transgene that's going to help a host okay so you need to understand this term you definitely need to 
understand this term. It's definitely going to be on the test. And two of the lectures today are entirely focused on this paratransgenesis concept. Okay, and, and just more background for this paper. Within the bee, so within the bee, okay, within insects, we have, a, in theory, limited options. We have to give the transgene to something that's capable of living inside of the bee. So within the bee, uh, in its gut, it has a symbiont, and the name of that symbiont is Snodgrassella alvi. Okay, so this is a bacteria. The bacteria, it's gram negative, okay? And it looks like a rod. So if you've seen shapes of bacteria, bacterial rods look like this, okay? And snodgrass, just so that you know, snodgrass is a very, very famous entomologist. Entomologists are people who study bugs like me. Um, I'm an entomologist. And snodgrass was very, very famous for characterizing insect morphology. Okay, so this, this bacteria, which lives inside of a bee, is named after snodgrass. Snodgrassella albi. Kind of a funny name. Okay, but you need to know that this is a gram-negative bacteria that lives inside of bees. Okay? So the central question, the central question of this paper is can snodgrass cella be engineered to protect bees? That's what this whole paper is about. Okay? And the way that they the, the way that they try to engineer it is they use a mechanism of RNAi. Okay? And Hopefully you watched the pre-recorded lecture on RNAi. I don't want to talk about the complete mechanism right here because I spent 50 minutes talking about it in a previous lecture. So hopefully if you haven't watched that, you'll watch that where I explain the mechanism of RNAi. But they want to engineer Snodgrassella, the symbiont, to induce RNA interference in the bee, okay? And just again, just to quickly, quickly... Um, briefly go over this rnai involves the risk complex okay so you, what happens in rnai is you need some inputs okay you deliver double stranded rna and then if if dicer plus the risk complex are present then the then the organism then the insect in this case then the insect can do rnai which is knockdown rnai is knockdown of target genes okay so they want to engineer the bacteria they want to engineer the bacteria to knock down certain messenger rnas okay and so you might think what are going to be their targets okay so let's let's talk about this more what will be their targets okay obviously if rna viruses rna viruses like deformed wing virus if they're present in the bee that's going to be one of their targets they're going to try to knock down the virus okay so knock down the rna viruses okay the other part of the equation are the mites. So they might try to knock down essential mite genes. Essential means if they don't have them, they'll die. Okay, so they might use the double-stranded RNA as a mechanism to kill mites. And they could do that by knocking down essential mite genes. Okay. Now you'd have to be very careful about picking the targets of the mites. You'd have to make sure that they wouldn't also target genes in the bee. You'd have to find special unique mite genes, but they, they're able to do that in this paper. Okay, so that's the, that's the first basic plan of the paper, okay? So let's talk about the first experiment. The first experiment, okay? Can GFP 
can GFP plus snod gracella colonize bees? Okay. So the first question is, the first question is, if we engineer the symbiont, will they still be able to live inside a bee? Okay, you might worry that they might have a fitness cost. You might worry that the symbionts themselves might get sick and they might not be able to survive in the bee if you start engineering them. So this is the first experiment, the very first experiment that they do. Okay, and the way that they do this is step one. They give snod gracella a plasmid with GFP. Okay, so there's going to be a promoter. So they're going to make a plasmid and it's going to have GFP and there's going to be a promoter and there's going to be some selective cassette and they put this inside snod gracella. And what this is going to do is it's going to make snod gracella grow glow green. Okay, because GFP is a green fluorescent protein. So it's going to make the bacteria fluoresce. And then they try to infect bees. So they see if the bee guts become green. Okay. They just look to see if the bee guts are going to become fluorescent. And if the bee guts become fluorescent, then they can answer the question of the symbiont can then colonize. So let's look at the data. This is figure one. Okay. So let's first look at this, this figure right here, figure 1A. And the first thing in the y-axis you see is colony forming units per B. So I should spend a little bit of time defining this. Okay, so on the y-axis, you see the term colony forming units per B. CFU means colony forming units. Okay, so what they do is if the bee is infected, let's draw the bee. Okay, if the bee's got the green bacteria in its gut, what they can do is they can take that bee, okay, and they put it in a tube, put the bee in the tube, here's your bee, and then you smash it, this is like a pestle, pestle, smash the bee. Okay, so smash it, smash it. And then they can just take the, they can just add, they could in theory just add some water, add some water, H2O. And then they take a plate, a microbiology agar plate. Okay. And this agar plate would have, in theory, a selective media, okay? So whatever, whatever that selective cassette was on the GFP plasmid, I don't know exactly what it is in the paper. Just imagine it's canamycin, canamycin resistance. If that was the case, then they make, they would make LB or whatever they grow the, whatever they grow the snodgrassel on, they would make media plus canamycin. And then they would smear the smashed B onto the plate okay so they would they would smear the bee if you had like a this is a glass rod okay and they would just go like this on the plate okay smear the bee on the plate and if colonies grew if bacterial colonies grow under the selection you know that these are these green bacteria because they have this plasmid and then you can count, you can count the number of colonies, okay? And if there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, this would be 10 colony forming units, okay? So you could imagine colony forming units could either be very, very small or very, very high, depending on how much bacteria are in the bee, okay? So it's a way to quantify CFUs quantify how much bacteria is in the bee. Please mute your microphones. Okay. 
So now that I've defined that, let's go back to the data. Okay. So here they're they're testing they're testing inoculations, different inoculations. That means they're feeding the bee or injecting the bee, probably feeding, feeding the bee these different concentrations of transgenic snodgrassella. Okay. And what you're seeing on the y-axis is how many actually colonize, okay? So 10 to the eighth is much more, 10 to the eighth is greater than 50,000, okay? 10 to the eighth is greater than 5,000. 10 to the eighth is greater than 500. So the bacteria are growing, okay? When you get them into the bee. Let me just check to quick see what what's the green and what's the blue. I think the I think the green is the transgenic bacteria and the blue is the wild type bacteria. Okay, so the blue would be their negative control and the green should be their transgenic green bacteria. Okay? So the point of this figure, the point of this figure is yes, engineered Snodgrassella can replicate and grow in bees. Okay, so that answers their first question. The first question that they have is answered. The next question is how long? How long do the bacteria live inside of the bee? Okay, so this is days after inoculation. So B, it's the same same experiment. You inoculate and then this is days, so five days, 10 days, 15 days. And the, in the, the bacteria, these are the quantified bacteria at 10 to the eighth CFU, they're still there. They're still there after 15 days, okay? So let me just write this out. The bacteria are still there after 15 days, okay? This is really, really good. That's good because I don't know how long bees live. Imagine imagine a worker bee lives for a month. I don't know, but 15 days, that's a long time for an insect, okay? So the fact that the bacteria are in the insect for 15 days, that's really good, okay? That's plenty of time to try to make a phenotype, make a transgenic phenotype or try to protect the bee. So that's good. Okay. Now they also just show you a picture. Just in case you didn't believe them, they dissect out the bee. So here's the bee's gut. And this is a part of the gut called the ilium where this box is. Okay, so they dissect out the butt or the, the gut, not the butt. Uh, e is the negative control. Okay, so there's no transgenic bacteria. And F is the is a fluorescent bacteria. In this case, this fluorescent marker is crimson fluorescence, E2 crimson. So that's why it's glowing blue and not green. It's a different, if it's a different transgene. But here in E and F, they're proving to you, they're showing you that like, look, you can see, here's your eye. You can see the bacteria, there they are. And this is the positive test. And this is the negative control in E, okay? So this is very, very easy to understand what they're doing here. Very easy, very, very clean, very good, very good first figure. Okay. Second experiment. Second experiment. Second experiment is, can we make double-stranded RNA from a plasmid with two promoters? And can we express it in the bee? In the bee. Okay. So let's talk about what they do here. So what they do, and this is in the supplemental figures, they build a plasmid that looks like this. Here's the plasmid. It's going to have a selectable marker. And they put GFP just as a first test. Okay. So they put a transgene GFP. And here's what's special. Here's what's unique. They put a promoter going this way, and they put a promoter going this way. Two promoters, two promoters in two different directions, in two directions. 
one point five to three, and the other points. I guess in theory five to three on the other strand, okay? On the other strand. So what this is gonna do is when when this promoter gets turned on, and I should say this is a constitutive promoter, okay? So it's always on. These two promoters are always on. It's a powerful bacterial promoter. I think it was the CP25 promoter or something like that. But it, the point is it's a constitutive promoter. It's always on. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna make one messenger RNA going this way, okay? So I'll put this one here. It's gonna make this one going this way. This would be the sense. And it's gonna make another messenger RNA going this way. Going this way, the anti-sense, okay? And what's gonna happen to these two, okay? If this is single-stranded RNA, there's going to be bases that are looking for hydrogen bonds. And in the anti-sense, it's going to be the same thing. Single-stranded RNA. So there's going to be bases that are looking for hydrogen bonds. And because these two match, they're complementary strands. Because this matches, they're going to form what's called DSRNA, which is double-stranded RNA. They're going to form this. Okay. Now this, from the RNAi lecture, we should know this is the input for RNAi. Okay. So once they make this plasmid, they give this plasmid to the snod gracella. Okay, so they give this plasmid to the snod gracella by transformation, and then they put this bacteria in the bee, in the bee. Okay, and then what they need to do after this is they need to measure for the DS RNA. Okay, they need to measure for this. They need to see if it's being expressed in the bee. So the way that they do this is they use something that you should be sort of familiar with. They use a process called QRT-PCR. Okay, so we know, I've talked many, many, many times about RT-PCR. We know what that is. That's PCR with reverse transcriptase enzyme and it makes cDNA and then from the cDNA you can PCR and what this measures is it's a measure of messenger RNA or transcript okay now the Q what's the Q the Q means quantitative it means they've set up an experimental protocol. Usually there are special thermocyclers for this and they can quantify how much transcript is there, okay? So QRT-PCR is a way to quantify how much transcript is there, okay? And this is all in the supplemental figure. So this is in the supplemental. In a good translation for this is like extra stuff, extra stuff, like my my bonus content. That would be supplemental, okay? So these data are in the supplemental. But what they essentially find, what they essentially find is the answer is yes, they can express DSRNA for GFP. And here's the interesting thing. Where do they find it? Where do they find the DSDNA? The bacteria are in the gut, okay? And yes, they find DS RNA for GFP in the gut, but also, also, they find it in the head, the gut, and the, what was the other one? I think the thorax. So they split the bee into the abdomen, the thorax, and the head. 
and they find the RNA in the head of the gut and the thorax. So what does this mean? If the bacteria are in the gut, what this means is there, so let's draw out what this would mean. If here's the B, here's the B, here's the, here's the bacteria in the gut. They are making double-stranded RNA in the gut and they're secreting it, secreting it, and it's getting all over. It's getting into the head, it's getting into the thorax, and it's getting into the body, the abdomen, okay? It's getting all over. This is good. This is good that the dsRNA is everywhere, okay? Because this is what you need. This is what you need for systemic RNAi. Okay, so this is, means we're going to get a knockdown. In theory, they should get a knockdown. They should be able to knock down genes, not just in the gut, but everywhere. Everywhere in the bee. Okay? That's the second experiment. Third experiment. Third experiment. Now they know they know we can engineer the snodgrassella and we can get it to colonize a bee. That's point one. Point one. Can't even see my hand. Point one. <laughs> point two. Point two is they can engineer the bacteria to express double-stranded RNA. Okay. So the third point, the third point is can we knock down a B gene with the symbiont delivered double stranded RNA? Can we do that? So they first do a test. They need to pick a target. Okay, they need to pick a target. And they pick the insulin receptor. And you might ask why? Why would they pick this? Why would they pick the insulin receptor to knock it down, okay? And the answer is because there's a visible phenotype. There's a visible phenotype that they can see if they knock down the insulin receptor, okay? So what does insulin do? Insulin, insulin is a receptor for sugar uptake. So it takes sugar into cells, if my understanding is correct. My physiology class was long ago. <laughs> Insulin is a receptor for sugar uptake. So what was gonna happen if you knock it down? If, if we knock down the insulin receptor, they will, the bees, the bees will not take in sugar okay and so what's going to happen if they can't if they can't take sugar this is going to make them feel hungry this will make them feel hungry hungry they need to eat more it'll make them feel hungry and they will eat more this is a visible phenotype a visible phenotype that they can measure after they do a knockdown okay so let's look at the data Okay, so here's the data. First, this is quantitative RT-PCR, okay? This is, again, this is quantitative RT-PCR. The blue, blue, this plasmid right here is the insulin receptor knockdown. So all the blue data is insulin receptor knockdown. The orange or the yellow, depending on what, what you think, what your colors are, this one is a negative control. They're just expressing dsRNA for GFP. It shouldn't do anything. It shouldn't do anything to the B because GFP is not an essential gene in the B and the B does not have a GFP gene. Okay, so it's a negative control. 
So what you want to do is you want to look at the data and it's separated out into body part in the head, the head of the bee, the abdomen of the bee, and the gut of the bee. And in each of these places, if you compare the negative control to the blue, okay, what you're seeing is it the log fold change in messenger RNA for the insulin receptor. And you can see that each one of the blues is lower, 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 lower. So the answer is yes, okay, yes. They can knock down the insulin receptor, messenger RNA, in the bee. And they've quantitatively measured this, okay? So this is, the me this is measuring messenger RNA. Now below here in C and D, C and D, this is the visible phenotype that they can see with their eye, okay? So what they're doing is, this is response rate. They're feeding them sugar in water, sucrose in water. So each of these curves is how much the bee is, is responding to the sugar in the water. And in the knockdown, which is the blue, and the knockdown, the curve is higher. That means the bees, the bees feel hungry. They've made them feel hungry. This is a visible phenotype of the knockdown of the insulin receptor. Now the question is, do they eat more? Okay, so let's look at the data. That's data D. Okay, this is B weight. B weight on the Y axis. So what they have is they have, they can measure how fat a bee becomes, okay, by weight. And insulin receptor knockdowns all become very fat. They become fat because they eat too much sugar water. They eat too much sugar water because they always feel hungry, because they always feel hungry, okay? And this is the wild type, wild type bee, okay? So they make fat bees, <laughs> which is kind of funny. These are the fat bees, okay? Their weight goes up. Weight goes up and it's statistically significant. Okay, so the answer, the answer to their question, the third experiment, can we knock down a B gene with the symbiont delivered deep double stranded RNA? The answer is yes. Yes, we can. And we can measure it by quantitative RT PCR all over the body of the bee. And we can measure it by feeding phenotypes, feeding behaviors, and becoming fat. Okay? Fourth experiment. Fourth experiment. This is the big experiment, the big one, the big one of the paper. Can we protect bees, bees, from viruses and mites? Oh, that's the last one. Can we protect bees from viruses with this symbiont delivered RNAi system? Okay. So the next thing that they do, let's look at the figure. This is important. This piece right here is important, okay? So what they've done, I'll draw this out. Deformed wing virus is an RNA genome, okay? So I've drawn this out many times. It looks like a giant bacterial operon, okay? So the deformed wing virus genome. It looks like this. Looks like RNA. And they take a little sequence of this genome, okay, and they put it into a plasmid, the same plasmid that has the double promoter, okay. They put this little section, let's call it green, 
into their plasmid that goes into the snodgrassella. Snodgrassella. Okay. And then what's going to happen is the snodgrassella is going to produce messenger RNAs in the sense and antisense way that match deformed wing virus. Okay. And somehow the snodgrass cell pumps these out. Either it dies and explodes and they release these or it secretes them. And these double stranded RNAs get out into the insect. And this is going to initiate the RNA I pathway. Okay. So this will initiate RNA I against deformed wing virus because what they put into the plasma matches the deformed wing virus. So let's look at the data. And then what they can do, so once they, once they make this, okay, once they make this engineered bacteria, they get it inside of a bee. They put it in a bee, okay? And then they can take a syringe, a needle, and they can get deformed wing virus, deformed wing virus, deformed wing virus, and they inject the bee, inject the bee with deformed wing virus. And then what they measure is how long, how long does the bee survive? When does the bee die? Okay, let's look at the data. These data here, the dotted lines are a negative control. They're injecting PBS. So this is no virus, no virus here. And all these points are not significant. They're not different. No virus, no difference. Okay. Here, there is a difference. Okay. So these injections, the solid lines are plus the virus. They've injected with the deformed wing virus. Okay. And the purple, purple is higher. That means it survives for longer. Okay. This is a percent surviving it's a death it's a death curve this is called a death curve or a survival curve and if they have the double stranded rna for the deformed wing virus they live longer okay so the question of can we protect bees from viruses with the symbiont delivered rnai system the answer is yes at least we can make them survive longer. We can make them survive longer. Okay? So the answer is yes. That's a good thing. Okay? Fifth experiment. Fifth experiment. Can we protect bees from Varroa mites? with symbiont delivered RNAi. So now they're, not only can we protect with viruses, we will do an extra thing to make the paper even better. Can we protect bees from the Varroa mites? Can we kill mites? Okay, so this time what they do, let's look at the figure. Here's the figure. They redesign their plasmid again, okay? So this is the plasmid with the two promoters that's gonna make the double-stranded RNA. And they take out partial sequences of 14 essential mite genes, okay? So they take out little snippets, little snippets of mite genes, and they put them in this plasmid, and this is gonna produce the double-stranded RNA in, from the bacteria in the gut of the bee. And I don't know how it does it, but it kills the mites. So this is a percent surviving. This time it's not bees. This time it's not bees. 
is mites. Mites. And if the Snodgrassella carries the plasmid with the 14 essential mite genomes, the RNAi induced from that plasmid, the double-stranded RNA, gets into the mites and kills them. They die faster. These are the negative controls. PNR has nothing in the cloning site. And the GFP control is just a control, a negative control. GFP is not going to, obviously not going to have any effect. Okay. And the, the Varroa mite gene RNAi plasmid is obviously way lower than the negative controls. Okay. So the fifth experiment, can we protect bees from Varroa mites with symbiont delivered RNAi? The answer is yes. Okay. We can kill mites with this dsRNA system. Okay? That's it. Let's take a break for 10 minutes. This is a, just a fantastic paper. I really hope you guys read it. Now you should just really understand it. Uh, and hopefully you watch the pre-recorded lecture of the RNAi so that you kind of understood everything I was saying. But this was just a fantastic paper. Um, I'm glad you all read it. Okay, so let's take a 10 minute break. Alexa, set a timer for 10 minutes. 10 minutes, starting now. Alexa, uh, play 